Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top selling authors and the up and coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader, brought to you by Wellington Square Bookshop. Our guest today is Fiona Murphy, author of The Shape of Sound published by the text publishing company first in Australia last year, and then here in the States in the past few months. Fiona is a deaf poet and essayist. Her work has been published in Kill Your Darlings, Overland, Griffin Review, and The Big Issue amongst other publications. And though they are Australian periodicals and essays, you can find them online, trust me. The world of the deaf, those that have suffered a loss and those that have enjoyed a gain, is one that is foreign and unknown to almost all of us. And what Fiona's book does is help us to understand this world and to, in doing so, add to our understanding of the, the hearing, speaking world, hearing world, and ours, and is an understanding what this whole thing, whatever we're in, is all about. So it's always a blessing when we meet someone that can tell us things about our world. And I don't mean it that way. Our world that we didn't already know. And in this memoir, Fiona does just that. And along the way, entertains us, makes us laugh, and honestly, at times it does make us suffer. In the end, we come away not only more knowledgeable and a good reader will be interested in more. And Fiona is gracious enough to give us tons of resources at the end of the book that we can use in learning more about something that's been at times swept under the rug, stigmatized, and finally given some credence and value to a certain extent. So welcome Fiona and thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, really um, happy to be here. So I guess to begin, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, your upbringing, because that's another area, because it's Australia and your roots in Ireland, that most people just don't know about. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I'm the youngest of four children. My parents uh, immigrated to Australia and they met there actually. They immigrated from Ireland. And it was a relatively suburban childhood, uh, kind of fast, loose, carefree, really enjoyable. And um, I felt like any other child, to be honest, until I was in year two and my teacher started to notice that there was a few inconsistencies of how I wasn't able to read and write or keep up um, despite being earnest and enthusiastic. Nothing was sinking in. Um, so she suspected I had some sort of learning disability and suggested that to my mother, uh, which prompted a whole heap of tests, including a hearing test, which at the time felt like the easiest test of all, because all you have to do is press a button. And I was like, I can do that. I can press a button. And I felt like it was almost like a game. Like I was pressing, pressing away and left the little booth because you're in a kind of a soundproof booth doing it, feeling kind of proud of myself. Um, but at that point, that's when they diagnosed me with uh, profound hearing loss in my left ear uh, to the extent that at that time there was no technology, uh, hearing aids or cochlear that could uh, augment my hearing. And it was something that was surprising because um, even as the audiologist at the time was saying, this is, um, it's significant hearing loss, but you're such a nice girl, you'll be fine. So I was like, oh, okay, I guess, I guess I'll be fine. But in reality, I um, had a tremendous um, amount of difficulty learning how to read and write. And as a result of that, I kind of conflated the two of, deafness being um, a failing of sorts, um, which led me to hiding it for many, many years because I didn't want anyone to find out how hopeless I was. I remember whenever I go into that room, I always feel like a failure, you know, because I feel like I'm pressing it when there's no sound and not pressing it when there is. And it's just, I feel just like you. And then, you know, I come out and they look at it and it's kind of like a clipping at the top. And they always go, because I'm old, they always go, did you go to a lot of rock concerts when you were younger? <laughs> and I said, yeah. And they go, that's why it's flat up here because you can't hear above a certain range. And uh, kind of notice it now, but I know, but I, 
I'm like, yeah, I've never advertised it. I kind of like gloss over it, but there are some, you know, people will tell me my phone's ringing like uh, your alarm clock was. Yeah. I haven't heard it. I can't hear it. And I always think, well, the reason why they're telling me is because I must have just been, you know, depending to something else in my mind. So anyway, this is what I do. Um, before we go further, let me jump around again, as I said I would before we started. But as background, because he's one of my heroes, talk a little bit, because you mentioned him several times about Oliver Sacks, who I wish was still with us. And, uh, and a little bit about how he, ins it seems like he inspired a little of what you wrote about and maybe in your life too. Absolutely. Um, I too still feel his loss. Like in, like I have to remind myself that he's no longer with us because I've read his work so thoroughly and deeply that he, in many respects, it feels like I've had a conversation with him uh, back and forth. And it was really his writing um, of exploring the deaf community that really was shocking and astonishing to me because I didn't realize there was deaf culture or uh, artistic value in being deaf or philosophy or a sense of depth and language to it. Because even though I was diagnosed quite early in life, around six years old, um, it was almost treated like a, a problem to be fixed or solved. It wasn't like an opening into a brand new world. It was like, all right, you're deaf, learn to read and write and you'll be fine. Good girl on your way. And it was only in my mid twenties reading um, Sachs's work about his discovery of deaf culture that I was like, wait a second, but there can be something more like there are other people like me there's like a language that exists that isn't just gestures but it's actually has grammatical form and substance and syntax and all of this was news to me like there is a common misconception amongst people that um, if somebody is born with a condition there's the assumption that they know everything about the condition um, as if they're a walking wikipedia but there is so much that took me a, an astonishing long time to learn about my own hearing loss and what that means, um, as well as the kind of things that could come with it, the really positive things. And the thing that um, I found so useful and interesting was when Sachs started to lose his own hearing later in life, um, he did a few New Yorker pieces about the playfulness of hearing loss and the poetic value of it. And that truly gave me uh, so much joy. And that's where it really felt like the conversation began because I realized I too um, had found so much joy in words, even though it was quite difficult to learn how to read and write. I still find that anytime I mishear things, it's like, almost a game and a joke where I'm like oh my goodness how did something get so flipped in my head yeah it's like uh you know uh your porch to porch and Christmas Eve kiss my feet because yeah that like I said you laughed during the book and yeah and, and you just you just felt the same way when when it happened to you the other thing that I really identified with and I feel so sorry for my brother is they also arranged us in classes in order of what purported intelligence and I felt so great because it was the word was walrus and I was W and my brother Bob was S and I looked it over him and I feel I regret it so much but I thought I was so cool being in W and there was no reason for it he's smarter than I am you know it's just arbitrary things that schools do that's just so harmful you know and, and you went through that oh I was gonna ask you this so here we are just talking and people and you've encountered this are going to wonder, well, wait, she's deaf. How is she talking to us? And so maybe if you could explain a little bit about your left ear, your right ear, anatomically, what's going on with you? Yeah, um, this is one of the reasons why I kept it a secret for so long, because I've picked up so many tricks along the way of how to navigate the hearing world. It, I can pass quite easily as hearing in most instances. Um, so it really helps that we're on Zoom. So firstly, the lighting's great. I can see your face and I can lip read. And you probably notice that I'm paying quite close attention the whole time as you speak. 
But with my form of hearing loss, I'm profoundly deaf in my left ear. So for most of my life, up until fairly recently, I've had complete hearing in my right ear. And what that means is that I, I still receive sound waves and information through my right ear. But what that does, it doesn't mean that the volume of the world is half. So it doesn't mean that it's softer. It just means that my brain has less information to decipher and problem solve with. So for instance, if I closed my eyes, I wouldn't know the direction sound was coming from. So even if you're standing right in front of me, I would have no idea where you would be in space whatsoever, because in order to locate sound, you need to have two functioning ears. And it kind of works like a set of coordinates where the brain compares information from the left and the right ear to determine where someone is. But I just don't have that ability to locate sound. And another thing with unilateral hearing loss is it means that everything is at the same volume. So if, I, if we're having a conversation next to a, a microwave or a tap of running water, I would hear the running water or the microwave at exactly the same pitch and sound and volume as your voice. So it's like almost being in a snowstorm all the time because you just can't see through it, through all the sound. It's all just rushing at the same volume. Um, which are things I didn't know until I was older, uh, well into my teenage years. And uh, to be honest, uh, suddenly made a lot more sense why I was tired all the time because it is a lot of conscious having to problem solve and think. So if someone calls my name out, I'm having to scan the environment to figure out where they are. Or if we are talking with background noise of having to decipher what you're saying as well. Yeah, it's funny because when you're talking about space, what does it remind me of? Oh yeah, when you quote uh, Gaston Bachelard and you say, I am the space where I am. And I thought a lot about that. Actually, I've thought about it before. It's like kind of a blessing and a curse in a way because you are part of everything, but you're also just that too. And that's kind of what you're talking about a little bit, I think. Yeah, I was really interested in the sense of sound as being more than just noise, but sort of a, a physiological experience because I think some of the tricks that I was alluding to is that I very much use the world around me to try and augment sound so say if we're in a crowded room or at a party or something like that I would gravitate towards corners and walls and places of soft furnishings just so that I can get the environment to do a little bit of work for me um, because in people with um, complete hearing their brains are doing that work for them of um, in that crowded room if I if they were to give their attention to a, an individual their brain dampens down the background noise and elevates the voice or the person that they're paying attention to almost like a selective remote control of some sort um, which is kind of astonishing to me. I still can't believe that people with complete hearing can do that. It seems like a magic trick. It's, I, I honestly cannot wrap my head around the fact that people can do that, but uh, it is useful to know how hearing can work because then it gives me a lot of understanding of why I get headaches, why I feel frantic and stressed in certain situations and why I spend so much of my life in corners trying to funnel sound towards myself. It's funny that um, there are so many things I do that irritate people, but this is one of them. I can sit in a restaurant and I can listen to four or five different conversations at different tables. The problem is I cease listening to the conversation at my table. <laughs> The other thing that's really cool about your book is there's so many people in it that I like, like Brian Eno or um, Cantor, the math, <laughs> this is one of your mistakes, Cancer and Cantor. But yeah, Cantor and the infinity of infinities and the set of all sets that don't include themselves, and then Hilbert, and then um, uh, Bertrand Russell and Kurt Gödel and all those guys. But it's so funny because there's so many places in the book where I go, oh yeah, you know, it's just like a moment of epiphany. One of them was the Cartesian dualism that you talk about. But I do disagree with you because you say it's a swift and bloodless 
incision. And I don't look at it that way. I think it's like all mushed up in the middle and things are going back and forward just because there's been so much dispute over, over the centuries. You know what I mean? I do. And that's something that I had to think hard about in the writing of it because it's packaged up as a memoir. How I sort of structurally navigated that was the idea of um, taking the reader by the hand through a series of experiences that I was learning or relearning about. And when I got to that point, my thoughts have shifted significantly. But at that point in time, it did feel like a real sense of injustice is probably the wrong word, but it felt like that this um, mind over matter sort of concept was really caused a lot of grief and misunderstanding within the scientific community of how bodies are viewed and um, yeah, it, it, I think because I was reading a lot of scientific literature at the time, it can, it almost felt that it just came down to this one dude who said something and I was like, oh, holy heck. And being so emotional about trying to figure out how, um, how, how it's possible for a community to be so marginalised, it does help to have someone to point the finger at and be like, hey, <laughs> it comes back to you. But it's much more complex than that. Well, it's funny because I would have to say that the crux of this book, honestly, is about a cigarette that you've kept for so long. And I thought talking about stressed out, it must have been so much work. I can just, no wonder physically, like clenching your teeth and needing the night guard and all that. It's like, I can't, why did you keep it a cigarette? Why didn't you just? come out with it you know you know that you know it's like funny because it's people who are de depressed clinically depressed their family will say to them why can't you just be happy and they think that's the answer but it's not the answer and your family did that to a certain extent yeah um so to give everyone context i i was diagnosed at six years old um but then i pretty much kept it a secret from everyone for about 20 years or so and for the longest time it didn't feel like a choice it felt like a necessary safeguarding of myself because particularly when you're in the classroom environment and you know for a fact that you are at the bottom of the class and there's the implicit assumption that you should possibly not even be in that class but in a completely separate stream you will uh, keep things to yourself, like quite naturally, I think, as a form of self-preservation. So for me, um, I had a lot of shame about being deaf. I didn't have any deaf role models. As I said before, I didn't have any exposure to deaf culture. Um, so there was no kind of pride in me saying like, hey, I'm deaf. Or, and I, and I think this is a really important thing. I wasn't explicitly taught how to advocate for myself or what access requirements were because I wasn't told what my hearing loss involved. So it took through a lot of trial and error to me, for me to realize that in certain environments, um, things get really tough, say um, a noisy room or having a conversation on a street with a lot of traffic. And maybe if we moved around the corner to somewhere quiet, I wouldn't be as stressed. I just didn't have the life skills or the advocacy skills to um, navigate those things. It was somewhat easier just to keep it to myself. But the thing that I found really fascinating um, during the research of the book is how prevalent secrets are and the research base around secrets, um, which I found astonishing, the fact that um, secrets have been studied so scientifically. And on average, the average person has about 13 secrets of varying values and actual physical properties to these secrets. So somebody with a secret um, will react accordingly. So they'll perceive um, the secret to be a physical burden where distances appear uh, further and hills appear steeper. So when you are carrying a secret, 
you're moving in the world completely differently. Yet so many of us have secrets. So that kind of idea of um, how common secrets are really sparked a lot of curiosity within me because my goodness, they are so much work. <laughs> there are a huge amount of work. I know, I, and I can speak. Here's one thing, you kind of did this as an aside, but I took it to heart where you kind of said, you know, you go around your quotidian day-to-day, -day, well, that's redundant. You go about your quotidian existence and you do what you do. You, we're talking like this. I don't have time to think about my secrets, but then when you go to bed and maybe you don't go to sleep for a while, all of a sudden they creep out. Mm. And it's really scary. And, but other people just compartmentalize them, put them away. I can't do that. Put them away in a little suitcase in the corner of your head and they never really look at them. I don't know which is worse, but yeah. So yeah, so we all have those. But when you're 26 or 27 or 28 and you're doing your CV and you don't put it on there because you think I won't get the job, then what happens when you do the interview? Is it just like you and I talking, you're looking directly at my lips moving and you just, you get by or more than get by obviously well it really helps when um i know the subject matter well of a conversation because then um kind of to go back to oliver sacks my brain isn't problem solving with random words i kind of have a phonetic grasp on what someone is saying so so if it was a job interview set up um and i'm trained as a physical therapist I would have a good sense of what the content of a conversation would be. So it's almost like an easier interaction than say a random conversation when we've had a few drinks at a party and somebody could be talking about anything from the weather to football to spaceships or whatever. And my brain is having to scan through all these permutations of what a word could possibly be. So in that instance, it's a little bit easier, but but to be honest, even though I'm open about my um, deafness now and I'm quite proud of it um, and I have felt a sense of safety in the culture and language, I would still be quite cautious of um, presenting as deaf in job situations because even though there is legislation against discrimination, Unfortunately, in Australia, how the safeguards are set up, they still favour employers in many instances. Um, and there's still a lot of um, stigma, unfortunately. Um, yeah, so it becomes, it's still, what I really hope that the book would show is that there is so much intelligence and rigour to being disabled in the world, that we have so much um, to offer and at the same time, there's still so many barriers that exist. Um, so I didn't want it to kind of be like this joyful arc of going from somebody who was a little bit clueless to just unbounding joy. I kind of still wanted to show that no, things still need to change in many instances. It's funny that you talk about familiarity with the context of you know, you knew a lot about physiology. So when you go in to talk about it, you know pretty much what's going on. And I practiced law for 30 years. And when I was in trial, I never had notes because if you know what's going on, if you know what's happening, you just say it. And like when you yeah. would become a comedian and they said you were so natural and not like, but I had a partner and everything he had was on three by five cards. And one time in his closing argument, he dropped them and they became out of order and he just, he just froze. Oh my goodness. And, but what you've done and I'm not tooting my own horn, but what I've done is if you learn what things are about, you can pretty much handle pretty much anything life throws at you. I think so. Absolutely. But I also think you can adapt to a high degree of stress when you're sort of, say, used to being in uh, challenging or stressful environments, um, whether that's a, a good thing for your body and heart, I'm not sure. <laughs> but navigating and problem solving, I think they're the two great words to um, describe a lot of life with disability. When, uh, here's one thing I disagreed with you on. When you go to the bar, we'll see when I was in, in London, 
my brother and I were playing pool with these guys and we thought we'd be cool to get the right beer. But the name Strongbow sounded so cool that we got it. But it was cider. It was horrible. I can't believe you even like cider. It's disgusting. It's like Strongbow is a particularly not great cider. Like that's the cider we use for cooking. <laughs> like that's <just> cooking cider. <laughs> Well, it's a good name though, right? I thought it was great. Name. <laughs> All right. Well, so here's a good question that people are going to be thinking because you go back and forth and you don't like them is, you know, hearing aids and especially the bone conductivity one that I assume you haven't yet done or may never do. Correct. It's still a possibility. So just to give context around that, um, Whilst I'm profoundly deaf in my left ear, in more recent years, I've been progressively losing hearing in my right ear. And that's due to a genetic condition called otosclerosis, um, which is a condition where the, the tiniest bones in the body, um, the bones in the ear are starting to ossify and harden. So it's almost like the bones are creating their own form of exoskeleton. Um, they shouldn't be growing more bone there, but they are. Um, so standard hearing aids uh, wouldn't be able to augment that because it would be like sound waves trying to travel through a brick wall. They would just bounce right off. So this is one of the possible solutions um, is to have a bone anchored hearing aid. So essentially a metal bolt uh, screwed into the back of my skull um, and it would have a receiver on it and sound would travel directly into my skull. Um, it's a bit of a big decision that I haven't made yet, but I think um, possibly I would go down that path, but uh, I'm not sure just yet. But like you said, my, my views on hearing technology uh, remain in constant flux. I, I think it's fantastic people have choice, but I also think that there's a lot of um, misconception with the general public around what hearing technology has the capability of doing. A lot of people have to make this really general analogy, um, which you may have heard of before, like, it's like putting on a pair of glasses. Easy as that. It's not, not at all, because you're dealing with a brain and information and um, hearing aids are not the same as functioning ears at all. Um, some people have a great experience. Uh, the vast majority of people, according to research, do not and don't persist with hearing aids um, because it can be a pretty... Um, tedious and difficult experience um to navigate yeah it's funny because i wouldn't have thought of it but you describe it so well that you realize i don't basically i don't want all this coming in it's too much it's almost like sartre's nausea at the end it's like all of this essence is just too much for me and the other thing is there's an aside where you call it like you were saying it's kind of a miracle well the biggest hearing aid company in the united states is miracle ear and <laughs> It's, it's called Miracle Ear because that's what it's propounded and that's what they push at it. And they're so expensive. Right? Like my mother got them. They're like six or $7,000. They come in this beautiful jewel box and you lay them in nicely. And, but it, they never really work. And then some people in America are so cheap that they don't use them because they don't want the batteries to run out. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I, since um, releasing this book, I've had so many people say to me that they've just used uh, hearing aids from family members who have passed away. And they're like, oh, I tried them out. They weren't that great. I was like, oh, it's really interesting um, that they can kind of become a, a product, a commodity passed through the family, which if an audiologist was listening, they'll probably be like, no, that's why they're not working well. They're not fitted for you. I think... Um, there's a lot of money in the industry. Uh, it's an increasingly uh, growing industry, billions of dollars. There's a lot of commissions to be made in it. I think there's a lot of um, conflicting views. Um, but the main thing that kind of frustrates me, I love that people have choice. Um, I don't love the marketing around it because it really pushes 
all the responsibility of a conversation and communication onto the individual with hearing loss, as in you should just get fixed. You should just put in a bit of effort and just get hearing aids, not acknowledging the expense, the fact that they may not work as fantastically as people assume, and that they can be out of reach for a lot of people. And some people may just not want them. Yeah, it's definitely an interesting, it's like selling mattresses in the United States. You can sit there all week and if you sell one mattress, you've made enough money for the mattress company to stay in the business. And then if you're a good salesman, like this guy was for my mom, she would go back to him and he would be so nice. He became her friend. He would tune them up, even though I don't know what, it, what exactly he was tuning. Um, and the other thing is, so like when I go to the gym now, every single person is wearing Apple AirPods. And they look, they look incredibly stupid. And, and then they're talking to themselves. 10 years ago, because I'm an old guy, I would think they were insane. If insane is not a cancel culture world word either now. But that's what I would think. I would just think, what the hell is wrong with them? Who are they talking to? And now it's just accepted as a matter of course. And there, there, is, there would never be, a, and you, can, you can't even see hearing aids anymore. So it's basically just your experience, which you, in several pages, I understood why it wouldn't be necessarily my choice either. But I never would have thought of that before, ever. Ah, oh, I really appreciate you saying that because it was, um, I think with a lot of elements of this book, I was hoping to make people curious about things that they possibly thought were uninteresting. Like, I feel like that's where my interest lies in life is making the uninteresting interesting. Um, that's what I said in my introduction exactly. I, and I think that it's hopefully this book doesn't just um, kind of people don't come away with it just knowing a little bit more about deafness but perhaps a little bit more about their experience of their own ears because I think I'm not sure how many people spend time thinking about how much incredible work their brains are doing to navigate sound and like the physical sensation of it because hearing is so much more than ears and my experience of hearing is very tactile and visual and it's a like quite an intense sensory experience so um yeah but more power to the uninteresting stuff I reckon <laughs> oh, it's that's what I was saying in the introduction it's a good entree into things that things that yeah guys like us would never think of. The other thing that was interesting because it hits home for me is when you mentioned the word synesthesia because as soon as that happens, I think about things because in my life, there's when I was a kid, well, numbers had colors. And even today, I mean, Monday's light green, Tuesday's light brown, Wednesday's dark green, Thursday's dark brown, Friday's orange, Saturday's yellow, Sunday's white. And I've always been able to do that kind of things. How does that, how does that represent in you? I I think it's like anything else you know when you experience something so continuously and regularly at least for myself I don't stop and think is anyone else experiencing this so I found it really interesting as an exercise in writing the book to actually stop and think about how do I perceive the world and how do other people perceive the world and kind of almost fact check that against myself and friends and family and scientific research and whatnot but the thing that I didn't realize is so consistent with me is the taste of sound that's something that I just has really helped me to learn how to read and write is that kind of mouth feel of words because part of my hearing loss, I can't actually hear my voice. I don't know if I'm whispering or yelling, but I've become very good at reading other people's faces because if they're flinching, I'm like, obviously I'm probably speaking too high of a pitch or if they're leaning in, I might be speaking too low. So uh, I mirror my voice on other people's body languages. Um, and I can also feel the effort of if I've been holding my voice too tightly because I'm always afraid to be that deaf person who's yelling, uh, which is quite a common sort of experience that we've met many deaf people who can't hear their voices and it becomes the butt of a joke that 
oh, they're the old person who's yelling all the time. And I never wanted to be that person. So sometimes at least once a year, I lose my voice because I grip it too tightly. But that sort of sensation of the muscles in my throat is something um, has become, I'm very aware of what is happening in my mouth and throat at all times. And it's kind of transposed to this synesthetic experience of the world that a really interesting thing in terms of discovering things about myself with the writing of this book was in the editing process, my editor um, pointed out a lot of metaphors. She's like, you're mixing senses with the metaphors. Every time you describe sound, you're using visuals, like that's, that doesn't make sense. And that kind of shocked me because I didn't describe sounds in a way of sounds, it was always um, a sense of movement with them, or I was looking at the sounds. And we kind of had a little bit of a back and forth and I was like, yes, it might be quite wrong, but it's like how, I think it's my deafness on the page. And I got more and more confident with wanting to make this book as deaf as possible to keep what would be perceived as mistakes in there because that is how I perceive sounds is very uh, in a in completely visual sense of it. It's funny when you're talking about talking aloud it reminds me of my mother when she was in her 90s and the, the volume on the television in her bedroom was so high that it drove us crazy but we loved her so much and then I tried to get her headphones but she, no, she goes these are these don't work. <laughs> so we had to listen to this 120 decibel television all the time. We couldn't sleep. There was no cure for it. I wanted to soundproof. <laughs> I wanted to soundproof. Some um, egg cartons up around the place. Yeah. And also when you said loudness, it reminds me of a topic we should get into, which is sign language. And the funny part was when you would sign and they thought you were being histrionic and overly dramatic, which was really funny because I would never think something like that. So talk, talk a little about your experiences because it also takes up a good portion of the book. Yeah, so this um, learning sign language came in quite a haphazard sort of fashion. For the longest time, I didn't think that I was allowed to learn sign language, which to many people, particularly hearing people, is quite shocking to them because they're like, it's a language, you can just learn it. But um as a deaf child, particularly in Australia, um, sign language was always considered the last resort um, and learning how to speak um, uh, and kind of have oral communication was and is still prized as being a sign of that you've assimilated and that your brain is functioning and that you're a whole person essentially. Um, so sign language was always considered to be um, for the worst of the worst, the people who can't be saved. Um, so it had, it was quite stigmatized for a lot of my life. And I was so proud to be able to pass this hearing. Like I thought it was a real achievement that nobody knew that I was deaf, um, which is quite devastating to me when I think about it, because um, if anything, I was like the heart harshest judge on myself of if I got something wrong or I was so ashamed of being deaf but it took until um, my late 20s after having quite a ridiculous and almost comedic accident of singing a Stevie Wonder song in a bathtub shower and slipping and breaking my wrist which resulted in a surgery, which resulted in one of the screws um, cutting off the blood supply to my thumb and my thumb, the tendon to my thumb snapping, which resulted in another surgery and having to do a whole series of rehab. It was quite a dark and terrible year, um, all because of that Stevie Wonder song <laughs> and soap. But um, because I'm a a physical therapist by training, I really wanted to regain the full use of my hands. And it, coincidentally, at that time, there was significant bushfires happening in Australia and there was uh, sign language interpreters 
been shown on television consistently for the first time ever in Australia's history. There'd been a few during some floods a decade before, but this was the first time that they were actually highlighted as being an essential service for conveying um, emergency information. And just seeing their presence so consistently on television and start to show up at theatre events and art events in the city that I was living in, it piqued my interest. And I was like, oh, maybe I could rehab my hand. I could get some more exercise done in, and like meet new people. And it could be like a, a bit of a lark. Um, but it was only when I was in the classroom environment and immediately I felt comfortable because the layout of the room was designed for people with hearing loss. And I'd never been in a room like that before where it was so thought out and considered so the desks instead of being in straight rows or in small groups or clumps of like um, groups of desks it was arranged in a horseshoe shape so that wherever you sat you could see the faces of the other people in the room so easily and the lighting was so diffuse and like everywhere so there were no shadows so it was a few sort of small but si significant moments of being in a deaf space where I started to think like wait a second maybe maybe this is what's been missing that there is a language that suits my body that I don't have to work so physically hard to pretend to be hearing all the time that there's another mode of communication but it did take a lot of unlearning of things about the language and my understanding of deafness to fully embrace it. Because to be told that the only the worst of the worst should learn this language, like you've done so well to avoid learning the language, that's something you can't just shrug off quickly. It reminds you, I went to, I went to, a, I was staying at a hotel once where they were having a convention and everyone was deaf and I walked into the ballroom and it was totally silent, but everyone was communicating and it was very disquieting for me, which made me think, oh, it must be disquieting the other way too. But it was just, I was fascinated. And then that leads me to think about, again, all these people I like, when you talk about John Cage and the performance and the piano lid going up and down, but being entirely silent and the disquiet and the discomfort that everyone but then you also talk about this concept. You know, when they ask you, um, who, your friend asks you, what would you love to do if you had one day where you could do anything at all and you, and you didn't mention any people? That's me too. I love, I love going to restaurants by myself. I love going to the movies by myself. It's just so pleasant. My wife is not gonna like that. <laughs> Gotta embrace being an introvert. No, I'm an extrovert, but it's just, it's weird though because there's some, I guess, I'm such an expert that I really enjoy being with myself. I'm very, I admire, <laughs> I admire myself a great deal. <laughs> the most extroverted when you're by yourself. I really like me. Yeah. Yeah, lately, I've come to talk to myself and walk with <laughs> my dog for a walk. I realize who the hell is do, doing that? Who's this You've seen too many people with AirPods. You're starting exactly. to pick it up. <laughs> well, yeah. Even if I talk to myself now, it's fine. No one thinks Yeah. Anything. Super high-tech technology, you just can't see it. The other thing that really got to me was I was thinking, what should I think of this woman? Because you did that personality test and Steve Martin is great. You know, Margaret Thatcher and what, you know, kind of, but then Stalin. I know. <laughs> I thought you made that up. It really happened? Oh yeah, absolutely. And I still think about it almost weekly. Never do a personality test. Like you'll end up <laughs> getting uh, quite specific neuroses. It was terrible. Like I, I, and they led with Steve Martin on the thing. And I was like, oh, I like that. He's great. He's a uh, bit quirky, but you know, serious and focused and um, is very musical. So I thought, fantastic Margaret Thatcher I was like oh god <laughs> what a legacy of hardship and terrible but yeah it really hit home with Stalin I was like should I even tell people this <laughs> I really sat with it for a while I, I think you should have just mentioned the first two <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> 
or just made it up there, You're allowed to make it. actually a whole list of I the ones that I left out were like um Julius Caesar and Napoleon and I was like wow there's a lot of people really invested in war I don't know if that means I should just be like a project manager or something I don't know well speaking of project manager the interesting thing to me and it, it seems contradictory in a way is the idea of designing space not only for people who can't hear but for people who can hear mm. how did you come across that concept and are you involved in it at all now I do. Um, so that section of the book really kind of continues down that through line of architecture, but also um, the idea that we live in such a noisy, noisy world. Like it has been proven that the world is getting noisier and noisier. And I propose initially almost in a cheeky way, but I, I do think that it could work. But I think that deaf and hard of hearing people can solve the noise problem in the world in a way that is meaningful and could actually improve the quality of life for a lot of people. Um, and the way that I propose that is through exploring a little bit around deaf space, uh, which is a branch of architecture around deaf space design, which looks at how how space and sounds are physical entities that can be manipulated and enhanced and altered and augmented. Um, so a lot of people think about um, sound, well, in a lot of buildings, they don't think about sound design at all, which is a real issue. But in deaf space design, it's looking at how a body is in space. So for instance, um, it will look at how a body moves through space so that a deaf or hard of hearing person feels comfortable. So instead of a lot of stairs, there'll be kind of graduated ramps. So conversations can continue in sign language quite safely without any hazards or obstacles in the path, but also how we move around corners and change direction. So instead of having sharp corners, there'll be kind of a graduated curve to it or they'll be cut out so that you can see through the corner. So they're kind of, kind of very uh, deaf examples. But then there's examples of um, how light filters through a space as well. So kind of a diffuse light makes it a lot easier to see someone's face when lip reading, but also when someone's signing and then thinking about color contrasts of allowing an individual to kind of pop in a space so that there isn't a lot of visual clutter. And all this is to say is that um, a lot of people perceive deafness only to be in someone's ears, but it's a, someone's whole physical experience. And one deaf space designer put it so beautifully that if you wanna kind of experience what it's like to be deaf, don't plug your ears try walking backwards because that's the feeling it is or that feeling of not having the whole picture and information and that kind of heightened sense of uh, risk or alertness because your your sensory reach as they describe it is a full force like you're using all your senses to navigate the world and I do think if we start creating buildings that incorporate elements of deaf space design that it will improve communication to no end because there'll be a greater ease of having communication and I think a classic example would be um, hospitals where hospitals are always considered to be noisy spaces to the extent that it's almost a joke of like people not being able to sleep in a hospital but unfortunately, the level of noise that that creates is there's a lot of medication errors that occur. Um, having sleep deprivation um, makes it difficult for someone to recover from operations or illness or injury. If there's a little bit more deaf space design in that space, how much better would the health outcomes be for individuals? So it started as like a bit of a cheeky idea, but the more I think about it, the more I'm like, actually put us in charge <laughs> let us have a little bit more buy-in there yeah there's a great amount of expertise it's funny and you can disagree with this totally but when learning 
in a cheeky way that Cantor is your favorite mathematician. And then when you talk about metacognition or synesthesia, it all, I don't know why, but there seems to be like some weird common theme of all that. Not because, maybe because of your deafness, but it just seems like it all comes together, but I can't really articulate why. So I said- um, oh, That's really lovely that you picked that up because, um... I, I really hoped that things would thread through lightly, but consistently, almost right. like a spider's web where something way out here could kind of oscillate and affect something at another point in the web, which is kind of a really convoluted structure for a book and what a nightmare and a mess. But that's sort of how I went through the process of writing it was making a mess and seeing what potentially could have connected together and that led to really um I feel interesting kind of insights into things like going into Churchill like I never thought that I would why yeah. would a woman um writing a memoir experience of her life in her 20s in Australia mention Winston Churchill like I wanted it to kind of be fun and exciting for people to be like oh and how does that relate to John Cage? And then how does that relate to, like, I, I just wanted it to be a bit of a mess. Or Seamus Haney. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was thinking of the poem Dig. Dig has nothing to do with any of this, but then kind of does. But I, you know, it's really hard. I don't know if anybody else would, well, yeah, I think you did that. I think you loosely connect. Did you keep having fights with your editor about all this stuff? No, actually, she was so completely hands off that it was almost, destabilizing because she put so much trust in me and as like a first-time author I was like tell me where I'm going wrong and she's like no no you've got it just keep going um but it was really interesting um our working relationship because deafness and making the book as deaf as possible came up quite a few times when we were talking and one of the components of um being deaf as a child and um, my difficulty learning to read and write is that I miss a lot of prepositions. So those tiny little words in sentences um, just fall through, like they do not exist. And I can, they're all there when I'm talking. So I come across as quite fluent with English, but when I'm writing, no matter how focused and hard I try, I more often than not have sentences that are just missing so many prepositions. Like they literally are just so small, a unit of sound and space that they just slip through like a net. And she said to me, um, you're missing a lot of these. And I'm like, yeah, you know, what can I do? I'm trying really hard. It's just like, do you just want me to, do you want me to point them out or do you just want me to fix them? And I was like, just fix them, which was really nice because I there was I I think that was like really lovely of her because they needed to be fixed for a sense of fluency, but we kept all the other deafness there on the page of those kind of visual sound metaphors and things like that. Um yeah, it's it's funny nowadays because like you know, kids texting, you know, even if you say what are you doing, it's just an R and a U and or there's so many ways and then you know my my nephew spencer he'll communicate with me and I'm, i go spencer this is horrible grammar and you need to do this and you need to do this he goes did you understand what i was saying <laughs> that is a good litmus test unfortunately <laughs> and i said yes but it's like again you know being this old guy it's like even oh just happened a minute ago before the interview my son michael did some kind of statement on linkedin for our company and he said it's apostrophe s and it's not it was its and i said i said i sent it to him i said you know this he goes stop doing that <laughs> I, said, I guess i'm a dinosaur but i said all these people are going to read it and they're going to make a judgment based on the fact that you put the apostrophe in but i guess they're not anymore i don't know i don't know i feel like i've even though i um have all these challenges with um, prepositions and things like that, which is a really 
common experience uh, with deaf children as well as tenses like I have so much trouble with tenses and it's because the the back ends of words we tend not to say like they sort of fall off um, in terms of hearing I have become super pedantic about grammar and things like that so I'm right there with you <laughs> about the apostrophe no apostrophe because I'm like oh now that I've like come up to a level of English I want to stay there it's just because there's two things. If I was hiring someone when I was an attorney and they sent me their resume and there were errors in it, I recognized that there would also be errors in their work. Mm. So it immediately put me off. And it, yeah, it's like, or, or um, I had an appointment yesterday with some financial guy and he was late. And then I realized, okay, if he's late for this, then he's going to do other, he's going to miss other things and he's not going to consider them important. But I guess, I don't know, like I said, I don't think no one, no one cares about that anymore. You know, when I would go to hearings, as, you know, I'd be there, you know, I'd always be there exactly on time because that's what you have to do. And then someone would come late and he would say, well, I, 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 there was a lot of traffic and the judge would say, okay. And I'd go, no, you, you, count, you account for the traffic. You have to be there on time. But that seems to have gone by the wayside. Maybe we'll come back. I don't know. With Skype meetings and Zoom and stuff like that, if you're like five seconds late, someone's calling you into the meeting. I'm like, whoa, that's like it can get intense now. How does it work for you with Zoom meetings? They are exhausting. Oh my goodness. Um, I do like that there is a level of etiquette that has um, seems to have just come up through Zoom of people turning off their um, microphones and things like that. So there are some elements that are just beautiful, like eliminating that background noise. But the because I rely so much on like the depth of seeing someone's face in order to lip read and get a sense of someone's emotions and tone and things like that, it is quite exhausting lip reading off of a a flat face um, because there's, I mean, so much information there that I don't even know what I'm looking at, but because I've been doing it for so many years, it's, there's a sense of ease in person that just does not exist on a computer screen. What do you guys think? I don't mean to say it that way. That was bad. But what do you and other deaf people that you know of, like, do you like subtitles in movies? Do you like closed captioning? Do you think that's helpful? Do you think it's condescending? I love it. I find it essential. Like, I can't watch things without um, captions, um, mainly because there's so many, like, I don't know if it's because I'm getting deafer and deafer, which I am, but it, it just seems like people mumble now in every TV show and things like that. Like, how can anyone watch television or movies because yeah I don't know if it's more dramatic or something but people are like rum, rum. Um, so it's all just a mush of noise to me without having the captions there um well to close and this has been great but to close um two things one it's amazing and such a resource that you've done so much reading and that you give us the benefit of that but one of the things you say towards the very end is that most literature about deaf people is written by people who can hear. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, um, yeah, so I guess I keep saying this, I always say this is the last question. This is the last question. Um, when you did all this reading, how long did the process take you? Because there's so much, you just I mean, you get the 90, 90 some percent done on your iPad and you think, oh, well, the, it must, why is the book not done? And then you realize there's 40 pages of books that you've read. Yeah, and I, I put that in there because I hoped that it would be a launching off place for conversation of people to kind of, because like you said there, I mentioned so many things in passing and reference people and kind of, uh, concepts and ideas that I wanted it to kind of all be there like I adore nonfiction with resources at the end and it was such a joy to create my own resource um, list at the end of this but I also do think um, I did a panel with um, 
writers, uh, all female writers uh, with chronic illness and disability. And all of our books had extensive indexes at the end. And I, I kind of made the observation and thought that when you're living a life experience or with conditions that so often are marginalized, disproved or disbelieved or um, are belittled, it almost feels like you need to provide evidence to say, hey, this is my experience and other people have experienced it. And here it is. Here are all, this is evidence that I've like gone into this with hard research. And this isn't just emotion, but there's a lot of science behind this as well. Um, so that kind of index at the end kind of had a lot of different implicit meaning for me. Like I wanted it as a gift to somebody else who might be interested in learning more about deaf culture, history, hearing loss, science, but also as a way of validating my experience, which um, is kind of, I think, something that I'll always be doing um, because I still have people today go like, wow, but you're not deaf. And I'm like, yeah, no, but I am. Like, I'm very, I'm actually very, very deaf. Um, but hey, <laughs> so yeah, I'm really glad that you went through that index at the end because that uh, mm -hmm. I, I did a lot of fact checking on myself, which. Well, I always kind of get irritated in a way because, you know, I don't like the expression, but you end up going down the rabbit hole and it's so easy now because you can just type the words and there it is or you can go to YouTube. And the worst one was, and I must've spent an hour doing this, was when I reread Dig because of Seamus, I started watching YouTube videos of, of uh, Saad being. <laughs> That's actually surprisingly interesting, isn't it? When you like start going into like how bogs are actually being impacted by climate change, it's fascinating. I know, and they have these machines that just, take them out in little briquettes and then they yes. actually they're called briquettes and they stack them in their little carts and go driving them off and lean them up against each other so they dry out properly so you wasted a good two hours of my life and now you know all about the sods it's very I know. important I, I even sent the youtube to other people again irritating many of them but nonetheless <laughs> okay that was that's the la that was the last question I, I could keep going but and in any event this uh, Fiona, thank you so much. It's, it's a wonderful book. And as you know, I have a bookstore. So there it is. And it's out front. And um, it's an easy book. Oh, another last question. The cover is really, really good. Did you vet it? Did you decide? Because, oh, which reminds me of another question. Okay. But anyway, so how did you do that? That like, was... Like yin and yang. Yeah. Um, I had nothing to do with it which is fabulous because I don't have any sense of design, but the designer W.H. Chong from Text Publishing is award-winning and incredible, but he read the book and it's a set of hands, beautiful hands, much more beautiful than my like kind of workaday, callous, terrible hands. Um, and they're kind of almost cupping each other with a sense of space between them. And what he wanted to represent is an idea of, it's kind of multi-layered, the image of that. It represents almost like a canal, like an ear canal space. There's a lot of um, water metaphors throughout. So it's almost like two waves, um, but it also gives a sense of distance and a sense of yearning for intimacy um, between two hands as well. But a funny thing is, um, when the book first came out in Australia and New Zealand, um, some people uh, messaged me saying that they had forgotten the title of the book, but they just did the hands to booksellers and booksellers would be like, yes, oh, that's, that's the book, um, which I thought was really lovely that it's, it's not a sign, but it's become a sign for the book in itself. That is great. As a bookseller, I've learned over the years that the reasons why publishers do the covers is because they want to sell books yeah. <laughs> and because everyone who comes in does exactly what you're not supposed to do which is judge the books on our front table <clears throat> only because of the covers yeah absolutely or they would say confusing things i'm sure of like it's the blue book or the green book if you're like okay <laughs> help me out every day every day 
Well, Fiona, thank you so much. This has been a pleasure. I really enjoyed talking to you. And it's a great book. Thanks for having me.